Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. I really appreciate what Senator Robin had to say tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at the uh, older guy than him. <laughs> and the question sometimes comes up, uh, Governor, uh, why are you running again? Well, a year and a half ago, ladies and gentlemen, I knew that the build-up was imminent for Guam. I knew that this island is going to be overwhelmed with a population of another 33%. When I know in my mind that the infrastructure of this territory, the resources and water on the, in this territory can only hold 250,000 people to sustain, plus 10,000 tourists that are here every day. And if we don't step up to the plate, figure out what it is that the people of Guam want, I knew that I wasn't getting that. And I said that as an experienced governor, ways and means, speaker, senator, I knew that I had the experience to pull the leadership together and set the direction for this island. Because you have to have a vision. As a, as a leader. You cannot be a steward of government. As a governor, your job is not to sit there and watch the government. Your job is to take, stand up and start asking the people, where do you want to be? For example, as we move forward, what do you want to be in 2020? The people of Guam need to be pulled together and set a vision for Guam with attainable goals every year. As we did when we came, became Governor and Lieutenant Governor with Madeline Berdalio. The first thing we did in 1995 was we had to provide a vision 2001, which is six and seven years out. We called the community together. All of those guys that voted against me in the business community, come in guys. Because I told them, I said the first thing I found in the first day in office, I got briefed by Joe Rivera, who was there at the Bureau of Budget and Management and Research. He says, Governor, my job is to brief you on your first day. He said, Joe, what's up? Governor, we only have $435,000 in the bank. Said, That's pretty good. <laughs> said, no, 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 Governor, this is Tuesday morning. Remember, I guess Monday was a holiday, January 1st. And I said, so what? He says, by Friday, we need $6 million to make payroll. He said, Joe, what do we do, Joe? Is the governor will try to figure it out. So from that day forth, I knew that we needed to extricate ourselves from this deep hole that the governor Guam was in. And if you don't pull the people together to help you set the tone for the entire island, I called in the Bob Coles, I called in the Pete Morgan Mitchell, I called everyone in. And we sat down and we had Vision 2001, and we set those goals. People from the community, we knew where we were heading, so when we said, here's our goal, ladies and gentlemen, 2001, you want to go here? Everybody said, yes, we go. That's what you need as a governor, to have that leadership and set the direction of where this territory is going to go. I am really, really scared about this build-up. That if we're going to allow the build-up to happen, and that, that's what transpired in 1944, 45, and 46, you people don't remember. I remember part of it. Guam was liberated in 1944. The mission of the United States military was to end the war with Japan as quickly as possible. Guam was the staging point, Tinian and Saipan. But here's what they did. The mission was very important. The 22,000 leftover Chamorros, secondary, they took everybody out of Sumai. You know where Sumai is? The upper harbor? Okay guys, get up and go up the hill there. And you can go to Santa Rita. That's where you stay. And then they, the, once a year you can go there and look at the gravesite. That's all. They let you in once a year. They went and took all kinds of property. Indian Anderson Air Force Base, 5,000 acres. Tijan, Harmon Field, Fifth Field, Northwest Field. We had about six or seven air bases. 150,000 military personnel here with 22,000 or more left over. And they pushed us around, sometimes willingly, oh, please take it, you just liberated us. That's not going to happen this time. I remember that vividly. So I'm saying, military, we want to be helpful partners. 
We want to help you bring this build up because we want the build up. But we want it with the input of the people of Guam. Whatever you have behind the fence, we want it here, outside, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. That's right. And if you are intimidated by the powers that be, or you don't interact with them on a daily basis, if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. Colonel Gutierrez will go to Washington. He'll get in front of the president. He'll get in front of Congress. The brass at the Pentagon. Didn't even have to camp out in front of the White House or the Congress. Because if you're out of sight, out of mind. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think any other Guamanian or tomorrow has ever spoken before the National Press Club. I have. You've heard about the National Press Club, right? They don't just invite anybody. Well, thank God they invited me, but not for the reason about Guam. They invited me because of what I did at the Korean airline crash. They wanted to hear about it, but I didn't talk about the crash. I talked about Guam. Guam became very prominent in the mind of President Bill Clinton, and I was able to network with the government. I made many changes for Guam that you people probably don't remember, like the North American numbering plan. We brought one code for Guam where you're able to dial anywhere in the United States for two cents a minute when it was three dollars. That was on our watch. We were able to have them change the law for customs so that we can charge for every tourist coming in seven or eight dollars on your plane ticket so that we can finance customs because the federal government gave us that responsibility without giving us money. Bill Clinton gave that to us. So why am I saying all this? I'm getting running out of breath because there's no water. <laughs> so why am I saying all this? It's about leadership and experience, ladies and gentlemen, that you need now. We cannot have anybody practicing government this time. Believe me, you've seen it, and I also want you to know that as a governor, you've got to be with your people. Out in the boondocks, out in the community, out of the, uh, the Christianings, out of the baptism, so they can tell you their problems. Frank and I really believe that you have to listen, because no matter how silly some person's problem might be to other people, I make sure that I know that that person's problem is the biggest thing they're facing, and I will attend to it. I'll give you one example that I did as a leader. Remember when people couldn't afford to get their power hooked up? Because you have to buy a uh, cement bowl, electric dollars. First month as governor. I tell this story because it's very true. They came down to my office and they said, Governor, are you going to give us power in Matakwa, on our loop book, all through the jungles? I said, let me, let me check GPA. I called the powers that be at GPA and I said, why aren't you giving these guys power? They can't afford $1,100 per power pole. And this person wants 20 power poles in there, $40,000. Of course they can't afford it. I said, why do you have to use the, the cement poles? They said, Governor, the federal government gave us money to remove the wooden poles and put the hardening of the poles. I said, so where are those poles? They're up in the sense of, anybody remember those poles laying on the ground? Well, I went up there with them. 4,800 perfectly good wooden poles. And I said, why don't you use this? Sorry, Governor. The federal government said, you can only store them. You can't use them. I said, really, Rick? Stand in front of me, Rick. Who's the governor? You, sir. Okay, I'm ordering you right now to pick those 4,800 poles up and you store them standing up and put wire and give it to the people. Yeah. Woo! And to this day, like 15 years ago, those poles are still serving those people up there. 15 years. If it hadn't been put up then, they were still be without power because they can't afford it. Another thing is this CCU. They serve a good purpose. But how can anybody afford thirty-six thousand dollars to get water hooked up because you have to cross the street, or five thousand dollars to get a meal? It's unconscionable 
Some leader has to stand up and just kick them aside and say, that's not what our responsibility is. My job as governor is to make sure the people of Guam have water. Yes, sir. Because Woo! if you impact on the health care of the people of Guam, if you don't, allow them to keep putting the, their, their waste into the ground up at the aquifer, nobody's taking the lead. I will. I will. Brad Owen is going to help take care of that situation, and I promise you, ask any question you want. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Are you going upstairs? <laughs>